Press it now. Start recording. We can edit it to that. Okay. Uh, okay, folks, uh, we're going to begin now. Uh, thanks for coming to this debate on uh, which asks the question, do scholars of social movements uh, need Marxism? Uh, my name is Jeff Goodwin, and uh, I've been teaching here in the sociology department at NYU for many, many years now. Um, social movements, um, social movement studies is my uh, field of interest and in research. And uh, I'm joined um, by my good friend uh, Jim Jasper uh, from uh, CUNY Graduate Center, who will say a few words about uh, himself. Well, well I actually <laughs> want to just thank you for inviting me uh, tonight. Um, Jeff uh, described this as a conversation, and then I noticed it had become a debate by the time it uh, got into. So I was a little worried. I've, uh, in the 25 years I've known him, I have uh, studiously avoided competitive sports of any kind with Jeff. Uh, he's always been a little out of my weight class. Um, luckily, I've put on a few pounds in the last few months, so I think I'm ready for this debate uh, today. But anyway, thank you for having me. Well. You're certainly welcome. Uh, <laughs> glad you could join me. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I should I should say at the outset that this uh, debate or conversation uh, was really catalyzed by the publication of, of this book, um, and in fact, this event is uh, not only a debate or conversation, but uh, a kind of launch for the paperback edition of this book, Marxism and Social Movements, uh, just recently published in paperback by Haymarket Books, and uh, the good folks at uh, Haymarket, Jason Farbman, first and foremost, um, have brought along some copies of the book, should you uh, care to take a look at it. And uh, I, think it, I think it really is a quite an interesting book, and um, uh, as the blurb on the back says, I think, uh, honestly, uh, unusually, for blurbs, uh, the book is the first sustained engagement between social movement theory and Marxist approaches to, to collective action. I think that, that, that may be right. Uh, sustained may be the key word there. Uh, it is a, it is a uh, a hefty book. Uh, it has 20 odd chapters, some more theoretical, some more empirical, covering a range of movements across several continents and 150 years of history. Um, and, uh, and I have a contribution in it. So, um, uh, so I'm looking forward to the royalties and the <laughs> and the low two digits I expect um, for that contribution. Um, um, so yeah, uh, when the book came out, there was a, a launch um, up at uh, CUNY. Um, one of the editors, I should mention, the book is edited by a, a team of, of uh, including Colin Barker. Lawrence Cox, John Krinsky, and Alf Nielsen. And John Krinsky, who's, I guess, the local member of that editorial team, he teaches at City College. Uh, it would be great if he could have been here. I think we were hoping he could have been here, but I think he's run off to Finland or, or something like that. Uh, just like John. Just, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, kudos to, to those uh, people for for putting together uh, this volume, but I think in reality... He's really not in our weight class, No, I say. He, he's yeah. not. Um, uh, um, now I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> that was my point. You I was going to say, um, this was not really advertised to me as a debate about this book. Uh, so I can say uh, truthfully that I've read Jeff's chapter, and I highly recommend it. It's very good. Uh, equally truthfully, I have not read any of the rest of the book because I've been waiting for the price to come down from the $170 hardback. So I just got a copy, which I'm looking forward to reading, and I'm sure it will be very good because these editors are top right. But uh, the 
the conversation today is going to be about Marxism more generally and not about the book. I should make that clear. At least my part of the conversation. <laughs> I'm not sure about Jeff. Let me, let me throw in just one a small tidbit of information bef before we begin, uh, finally. Uh, and that is that my contribution, I should point out, was co-authored by uh, Gabriel Hetland, who's a, uh, finishing his dissertation at, at Berkeley. So, uh, so uh, I guess my royalties are, were just cut in half. Uh, but um, high single digits. <laughs> high single digit royalties. Um, okay, let's. Uh, that that's the context, the pretext for this discussion. Um, uh, let's let's get down to it. Um, um, I think the I think the the the, the topic the, the question could be broadened a, a bit. Uh, I don't think we're really so much concerned with scholars uh, per se. You know, do scholars need need Marxism to understand movement so much as does anyone, right? Activists, ordinary citizens interested in social change. Um, I think we know the the academic field uh, better than perhaps the activist field and and. and um, other fields of thought and action. Uh, so I'll certainly be talking mostly about scholarship on social movements, but we, we, don't, we don't want it to be a, you know, the, the question really is not so much about uh, what academics, uh, what ideas academics should have, but really what ideas should anyone interested in social movements have at their disposal uh, to, to better understand them and perhaps to make them. And uh, of course, I'm going to argue that uh, you know, uh, scholars, activists, ordinary folk uh, do need Marxism uh, to understand uh, social movements. But I'm going to focus on, as I say, the academic study of movements. I'm going to focus on that for a good Marxist reason, which is that <clears throat> the work we do on an everyday basis is the source of our um, beliefs, identities, a strong source of our beliefs, identities, uh, livelihood, resources, connections. Um, and what I do for a living is, is think about social movements, write about social movements. Um, and so, um, so I, think, uh, I think there's a Marxist reason for me to focus on, on my work. Um, uh, this is an insight, by the way, which you actually won't find in social movement studies today. Uh, it's, it's rare to, to find social movement scholars entering workplaces uh, anymore. Um, uh, the profound um, uh, importance of work uh, for our identities, understandings, uh, connections, resources, a basic Marxist idea seems to have been forgotten or lost by many scholars, um, but um, I take it seriously. Um, evidently, social movement scholars, uh, with very few exceptions, don't think they, they need Marxism. Um, and, and maybe that's the, the place to, to start this discussion. And it's the topic of my contribution to this volume, which is uh, has the title, The Strange Disappearance of Capitalism from Social Movement Studies. <clears throat> and uh, in this uh, contribution, uh, again, co-authored with Gabriel Hetland, we document, uh, you know, we look at the social movement uh, journals, we look at the prize-winning books, and what we found is that uh, uh, attention to political economy has virtually disappeared in the field, uh, and particularly attention to the dynamics of capitalism and of class conflict and class struggle has almost entirely disappeared, remarkably enough, from uh, the scholarship. Uh, uh, we looked at uh, a couple journals, uh, which are prominent in the academic field of social movement studies, mobilization and um, 
is one uh, US-based journal and Social Movement Studies, a UK-based journal. These are the kind of the go-to dedicated social movement uh, journals among, uh, among scholars. And, uh, and we, looked at, uh, we looked at the product uh, in, these, in these journals. Um, um, between, uh, well, in the case of mobilization, we looked at everything that appeared in that journal from 1996, uh, which I think is when it was founded, right, up until 2007, uh, 183 articles. Well, we didn't actually read all 183 articles, but we, we looked at the abstracts, and, um, and uh, yeah, the words class conflict and class struggle never appeared. Um, instead, you found um, concepts like political opportunities, some of you might know this one, 42, that, that, that concept appeared in 42 of the abstracts. The, uh, the concept of framing uh, appeared in 24 abstracts. So uh, uh, there, there are concepts out there which, which scholars turn to repeatedly, but class, class struggle, class conflict uh, are not among them. Uh, we, um, we looked, you know, you can read this contribution, but we looked at a range of sources, and, and the story was pretty consistent uh, across books as well as journals, and and we even looked in we looked in something called the Blackwell Companion to Social Movements, which is a well-known kind of uh, handbook uh, introduction to the field, which is supposed to provide a, an overview of the field. Well, there was one chapter in there on the U.S. labor movement by Rick Fantasia and. Uh, Judy Stepan Norris, but, but other than that, uh, capitalism is hardly mentioned at all. There are only a handful of references to capitalism, corporations. Uh, class struggle was referenced uh, once in this 800-page compendium on, uh, on social movements, and it turns out that Gary Marx was referenced more frequently than <laughs> Karl Marx. <laughs> Uh, so, so, uh, so that's the that's the starting point uh, for tonight's discussion, as far as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, what do we make of this? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, I think it's a bad thing. Uh, but let me let me stop here and see if Jim wants to has anything to, to say to this. We, we kind of agreed we wouldn't uh, drone on for too long uh, individually. So uh, I'll stop here before I move on to my other comments. Uh, Jeff agreed that he would not drone on very long. <laughs> <laughs> Did not. Um, this actually is sort of a continuation of a conversation that Jeff and I had uh, in public and in print a couple years ago which was, the, as Jeff is suggesting, the question of uh, do people who study social movements need the concept of capitalism? I think Jeff has made it harder for himself by narrowing it down to Marxism tonight because that's obviously only one theory of many uh, about capital, of capitalism. Um, at the time, um, I said, well, we need to break down. What, what do you mean by capitalism? Because I, I thought Jeff was a little vague, just sort of leaving it at that, when, which was sort of a a good moral cheerleading term, uh, yes, capitalism is bad, we all know that, we know that from the global justice movement, but what does it mean? So I kept, tried to come up with several things that I thought he actually meant by that. Um, one is the importance of money in social movements, and while the term capitalism has disappeared, I don't think the importance of money has disappeared from theories. Uh, resource mobilization is one of the main theories uh, applied to social movements, and it's really all about mobilizing money, the impact of money on organizations, uh, laws concerning how money can be spent, and so on. So, so I don't think that's what uh, Jeff was getting at. The, the disappearance of the labor movement from mainstream social movement studies, I think, uh, was partly what Jeff was getting at, more, more so, as he, as he said tonight. And uh, I agree with that. What has happened is that the study of the labor movement has become its own specialty. Qu 
quite different from the study of other social movements. And I, I, think, uh, I think we could probably all agree that it's a sort of a silly and unfortunate division of labor of the kind that springs up in academic life all the time. Uh, I should say people who study the labor movement have been just as culpable for ignoring people who study other social movements as people who study other social movements have of ignoring the labor movement. But, um, but I think that's, that's obviously a good point. Um, I think the other thing that the term capitalism connotes is a concern with inequal economic inequality and injustice. And here, uh, sort of capitalism is one explanation of the inequality that uh, certainly has become the big social problem of in today's world, especially in the United States, but elsewhere. Um, I'm not sure that scholars of social movements have ignored this. Uh, I would say that the, the most studied movement of the last 15 years has probably been the global justice movement. Uh, toss, certainly toss the Occupy movements in there, and you've, you've got a, a winner. Um, this is more true in Europe than in the U.S., I think, but in Europe it's become an obsession uh, to the exclusion of, I think, the study of almost every other movement of the last 15 or, or so years. So uh, there's definitely been a study of injustice. Injustice is taken seriously because the global justice movement obviously is about uh, economic injustice. So there's been a lot of work on flows of capital, flows of labor, uh, the politics in reaction to that. So um, in that form, I would say capitalism has not been ignored. So part of the question that I would like to ask is why we don't call it capitalism anymore, because I think we're studying some of these things just under these different names. And in Jeff's uh, earlier work, I'm not sure whether it's in here, and he especially points to <coughs> Chuck Tilley as somebody who talked about capitalism in his early work in the 1960s, but who really dropped the term and the concept, I think, in his, in his, in his later work the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, so I think the question we should ask in part is why? And it seems to me, and I'm sympathetic to, to Tilley's argument here, or to his, his shift, uh, he found it hard to work with, I, I would guess. Um, it's too big. And as he uh, went through his career, he became more interested in uh, much more concrete mechanisms, as he called them. Uh, he used the term mechanism differently from everybody else in social science almost. But um, he was interested in very small causal impacts. And if he couldn't, if he couldn't take capitalism, which is so broad, and look at the local effects, he wasn't going to use it. So that's my understanding of why it got dropped. So I think our challenge tonight is to break down the concept of capitalism um, and to really say, well, where do you see these impacts? What kind of c concepts can we use to make it useful? Linking it to Marxism, since this is supposed to be a debate about Marxism, I don't think helps. Uh, and first of all, it excludes us from all sorts of other theories of capitalism, including theories that I actually think would be more politically uh, helpful. Uh, there's a long moral critique of capitalism associated with what I would call the populist tradition uh, that is about people who work for a living versus the parasites at the top and the bankers who don't work for a living. Uh, so it has a very powerful history, uh, certainly in this country, uh, and that's a vision of capitalism that's quite different from a Marxist vision. And I think from a political point of view, if we're going to revive the left, we've got to swing that large, that's, that populist tradition back to the left. Throughout American history, it has swung from right to left, from right to left. In the 1960s, it swung, it, it, it swung to the right, and it has stayed there ever since. And we will never have a serious left until we get that to swing back to the left. And I think the analysis of capitalism that that has, this sort of indignation that certain parasites at the top 
uh, get more than their share and don't work for a living. Uh, I think that sort of moral indignation is what would uh, play better in this country politically. Uh, you see a little bit of that with the Tea Party. Uh, you certainly see that behind the Occupy movements. Um, it's not a Marxist critique of capitalism in any way, um, other than that Marxism doesn't like capitalism, but it's not the Marxist understanding of, of capitalism. So, so for, for both, both for <clears throat> political reasons and for our analysis, uh, I would say uh, I would be hesitant to restrict ourselves to Marxism. Um, I believe in a, a large toolkit of concepts to explain the world. And the history of Marxism has been, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't want to be one wrench set in our toolkit, among others. It wants to monopolize the toolkit and, 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 and be the entire toolkit. Um, we could talk about the history of Marxism a little bit and why that is. Uh, I think it's partly because it's been a quasi-religion that comes out of the 19th century in which positivism was the great um, alternative to religion, and I think it has elements of both positivism and religion. Um, I'll stray, I've strayed into that mostly to uh, get a reaction from the audience. It may not be what we want to talk about. Uh, we may just want to stick to you know, what are the specific ways in which Marxism can provide concepts that we can use to understand the various questions of social movements. You can't say just to understand social movements because there's no such thing. We want to explain how people get recruited to a cause, how a social movement emerges, uh, how it makes decisions, what kind of impact it has, uh, why, it, why it declines when it does, and they're very specific questions uh, that are what we're trying to explain when we are trying to explain social mm -hmm. movements. Mm -hmm. So that would be my, okay. I, think, I think that's a challenge for us this evening. But, but look, Jim, uh, uh, populism may have certain uh, rhetorical flourishes of use to the left, but you can't be serious that populism is a theory which, is it a theory at all? Is it a theory that can explain the distribution of money, that can explain inequality, that can actually explain the concrete <coughs> mechanisms that uh, generate popular movements better than, than Marxism? Uh, I, I don't see that. I, I, you know, I've been reading uh, theories of social movements for, for many years now. Actually, populism is, is not one of them. I'm not even sure what you're referring to when you talk about populism as an analytic framework. It's a rhetoric. Uh, and what's missing from it, and this is, this is where I want to go next, what's, what's missing from it and what's missing as we document in, in our contribution to the book completely, almost completely from social movement studies today is a notion of class conflict and class struggle. And I, I, want, to, I want to spend a few minutes talking about this because it does strike me as an essential concept uh, for understanding where we are today. Uh, look. Uh, the last 40 years uh, in this country has seen an unprecedented class struggle, an unprecedented uh, and incredibly intense uh, class struggle for most of my life. Um, it began when I was pretty young and it continues to this day. Uh, it's a one-sided class struggle, but it has involved the near total destruction of the labor movement which now accounts for fewer than 7% of uh, the private sector workers in this country. Strikes, the strike tactic has virtually disappeared with the, uh, with the collapse of the labor movement. Uh, wages, uh, uh, largely uh, or, or certainly in, in, in large part because of the destruction of trade unions and working class organizations, have stagnated for 40 years or more. We've lived through this, you know, 40-year slump, as Harold Meyerson has called it. Uh, pensions have been under assault, continue to be under assault to this day. Whole populations of uh, inner-city working-class people, um, mostly men, uh, have been, uh, are now marginalized, incarcerated, policed, paroled. Uh, they've become a surplus population. 
This is a vicious class struggle that characterizes, uh, you know, my, my adult life. Uh, social movement studies has had nothing whatsoever to say about this. You can read mobilization, social movement studies, um, prize-winning books. You wouldn't have an inkling that this was going on in this country from, uh, from academic social movement studies, where the very notion of class conflict, class struggle, has become anathema. Uh, that's a serious problem, you know. Aren't movements that are under assault worth studying? Not in this field of study, evidently. Uh, do we need to know why there hasn't been more resistance uh, to this uh, onslaught? Not in this uh, field of inquiry, evidently. Do we need to know, you know, how to rebuild a strong labor movement? Not in social movement studies will you find a word about how to do so. Go to labor studies, right? That's what you're told, right? The labor studies people do that. Um, and in fact, uh, what you find in this field is, this, uh, is a claim that, you know, we just don't study that anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's probably important. Uh, and those other people do it. But, you know, we've kind of moved on from those 20th century ideas of class struggle, economic redistribution, et cetera. We study the new movements, right? Uh, the new movements. Uh, and so social movement scholars, you know, often claim that there's a new kind of movement around. Um, it differs from the old. We study the new. You want to study labor movements? look elsewhere. Um, and there has emerged a kind of whole conceptual apparatus for justifying this distinction between old and new movements. I want to be fair uh, in characterizing this. Um, so I want to quote a passage which, um, which makes this case, that there's something Please don't quote me. <laughs> I won't quote you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, this is a kind of typical, uh, what, what I want to read to you is a kind of, you know, typical attempt. There are many similar variations on this, on this theme. An attempt to defend the, the, the idea that there's a new kind of movement out there uh, that we need to understand and, and focus upon. Uh, and so here's... here's um, <clears throat> You know, new social movements as, as opposed to the old. Of course, labor is old. Right? Labor is old and ancient and creaky and <laughs> white and male. Uh, Verda Taylor and Nella Van Dyke, a couple well known scholars in, in our field, write the following. Pay attention. The core thesis of uh, new social movement theory is that new social movements, such as the women's, peace, gay and lesbian, environmental, animal rights, disability rights, mental health, anti-globalization movements, and even the new Christian right and contemporary hate movements are unique in that they are less concerned with economic redistribution and policy changes than with issues of the quality of life, personal growth and autonomy, and identity and self-affirmation. Um, you, you see the binaries, old, new, economic redistribution, identity, policy, personal growth. Um, Love Verda and Nella, that this is nonsense. Okay. <laughs> this is nonsense. Really? The women's movement, the gay and lesbian, nothing to do with policy, economic redistribution, anti globalization movement about personal growth and identity. Uh, yeah, th this is just, um, this is quite frankly absurd. 
and this is, you know, this is a, a second important failing, I think, uh, of malady that afflicts our field, other than having to say not a, not a molecule of anything interesting about the times and about this crisis that we you know, have lived through the last 40 years. The field fundamentally uh, misunderstands these so-called new social movements by pushing out of the picture the class dimensions and the class struggle aspects uh, to, these, to these movements. Um, the women's movement, I think that was the first new social movement uh, that uh, Taylor and Van Dyke mentioned. Not so much concerned with economic redistribution and, um, and policy. Really? Of course not. I, I, I dug up the National Organization for Women's 1968 Bill of Rights. The, now, this group we love, we on the left love to batter for its middle class, <laughs> professional, uh, white orientation. Um, the Bill of Rights that they put out uh, around the time of their founding is a, pretty much a class struggle document. Yeah, they weren't calling for the overthrow of capitalism, but they were calling for some <laughs> profound reforms of capitalism that you for sure involved economic redistribution and obviously policy changes. It had eight planks, Equal Rights Amendment, enforced law banning sex discrimination in employment, maternity leave rights in employment and social security benefits, tax deduction for home and child care expenses for working parents, the establishment of child daycare centers, equal job training opportunities and allowances for women in poverty, and then the right of women to control their reproductive lives. This all has to do with the struggles working women confronted. And it was a demand to reform capitalism in a way which would make women more welcome in the formal labor sector, which would bring sanctions against discrimination in the workplace, make it easier for women to have children and yet still work, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's reformism, but it's a kind of class struggle. To talk about the women's movement, the gay and lesbian movement, as um, the environmental movement, as uh, you know, concerned with identity and uh, personal autonomy, uh, is to miss a, a very important aspect uh, of, of these movements. Uh, and if you don't, you know, if the idea of a class conflict of class struggle is not in your conceptual repertoire, you're, you're going to miss a substantial segment of, of, what, um, of what these movements are all about. Let, let me stop there. I, I should just mention, uh, this continues to the present day. Uh, the Paycheck Fairness Act has been in the news, pushed hard by feminist groups, pushed hard by the labor movement, resisted by um, pro-business, members of Congress. This is class struggle, people. It's, uh, what happens is the, that, this, the, the, that these struggles get, they either are uh, imperceptible to contemporary scholars of movements, or they get folded into broader concepts of, uh, of identity, uh, of recognition, uh, yeah, more abstract concepts which uh, elide the specificities of what's actually going on in the lives of people in these movements, what they're fighting for, what they're demanding. Uh, so, so again, uh, here's, a, here's a concept which, which Jim didn't talk about, class, class struggle central to the Marxist tradition, which has been completely lost and at a huge cost um, uh, to scholarship. Right. Well, um, I agree with almost all of that, as, as you know. Um, I've been a critic of the new social movements idea for a very long time. Um, uh, let me start with the 
class project. I mean, I absolutely mm -hmm. agree that there's been a devastating um, uh, attack on the part of the Republican Party aligned with rich people, corporations, but also aligned with a culture, culturally conservative segment of the population that is anything but rich. Um, class struggle, it's hard to make sense of the people in Arkansas and Kansas through a class struggle lens, it seems to me. Um, my question would be, um, is it class struggle if it's one-sided, as uh, I agree with you? It is. Uh, I think a Marxist image of class struggle is generally a two-sided. A Marxist image actually, in fact, uh, traditionally has emphasized the, way, the working class as the main actor. Uh, capitalists are doing their thing, responding to market pressures and so on, market competition. And, and this is a very different situation. This is a strategic political <coughs> project uh, that I think actually fits well with, with the populist tradition. This is a, a gr greedy grab by rich people uh, of, uh, to pay fewer taxes and to get more of, of the pie. Um, I don't see this as following in any particular way from the dynamics of capitalism that, as Marxism describes it. This is, this is something they did in addition this uh, American capitalist decided we're going to go out and we're going to exploit the working class more. We're going to take more. We're going to keep more after taxes. Um, this is, I, I, don't, I don't say the connection to Marxism in any way. It is, it's a class-based project, certainly. I don't see this as being explained by Marxism in, in, in any way. Um, but you're right. The class nature of this project is, is clear. Um, the new social movements issue. Uh, it wasn't clear whether Verda and Nella were agreeing with that or not. Think, they I said that they th this is the definition of were. new social movements. Okay. I, think they were, I just they wanted were to check. Because yeah. okay. um, you could define it that way and go on to be critical of it. Yeah. Just want to always want to check the context. Um, these the movements they mention. Uh, of course, they're interested in policies. To say they're not interested in policies is to really be kind of out to lunch, I think. Um, and economic redistribution. And I was going to get to economic redistribution. <laughs> uh, some of them are about economic redistribution. I'm not sure the animal rights movement is especially concerned with economic redistribution. The women's movement is, uh, especially the liberal wing of the. I mean, the it's the it's the sort of second wave feminists who are usually described as being more about culture and interpersonal relations and the, the now wing that is actually usually described as being about economic benefits for women. Certainly about economic redistribution, uh, but not by class. This is not a class project to redistribute money from one class to another. Um, these women did come from a particular class location. They were middle class, upper middle class, and so on. But that doesn't make it a class struggle just because it's about economic redistribution, it seems to me. Um, and a lot of these movements, if you looked at subjectively what they thought they were about, I think very few of them would say, we're about redistributing income, we're about, we're about class struggle. I think they care and are motivated by things like dignity and respect and recognition. And I would say the same with the labor movement. Uh, you get strikes, you get wildcat strikes in the labor movement when uh, somebody has been fired arbitrarily, when <coughs> a foreman uh, is nasty to a popular worker. Uh, these are not directly about economic grievances. These are not about material conditions. You don't get protest just because of a certain level of immiseration or a level of exploitation that reaches a certain uh, ratio, you get it when things happen that people are indignant about, uh, they're pissed off about, and that's what gets them out on strike. That's what triggers mobilization. A Marxist approach tends to have these sort of mathematical formulas to explain capitalism. Um, such that at a certain level of exploitation, or workers are, have just had it, they're immiserated, they've been pushed down far enough, and there's going to be a revolution. 
Uh, that or there are other triggers of revolution too, but equally sort of formulaic that really miss uh, what it takes to mobilize people, which is they've got to be really angry about specific concrete cases, not abstract formulas for levels of exploitation. So, um, yes, class mm -hmm. is an important part of all of this, and I think you're right that social movements folks have not done much better. Does Marx, what, what does Marxism add to our understanding of class struggle? Other than that, you know, it talks about class struggle, which is a good start. But uh, the popular, again, the populist tradition also talks about class struggle. Uh, there's class everywhere. There's gender everywhere. There's culture everywhere. There are emotions everywhere. Um, I, I, what I would like to hear, I think would be most useful to hear, is what specifically we can do with this other than, you know, is this more than just a call to bring class back in? What do we do with it as we bring it back in? Well, I'm, I'm just completely befuddled by, by these claims, <laughs> you know. Uh, workers uh, arbitrarily laid off, indignant about that, and a protest ensues. And this is not class struggle. Uh, class struggle only occurs uh, when workers demand, I guess, a higher wage when they're completely immiserated. A class, class is fundamentally an antagonistic relationship, right? Uh, and uh, workers get uh, antagonized by all sorts of humiliations and arbitrary decisions. It's a power relationship, first and foremost. And uh, sometimes the indignation arises, you know, because of uh, immiseration or a sense of uh, deprivation, but quite often it arises because people don't like to be bossed around, um, quite frankly. Uh, nobody does. Nobody does. And, and I don't understand, you know, to say that one is class struggle and the other isn't, I, I, I just don't get that. Um, um, the women's movement. When working women make demands on employers, which is what now is doing in that document and which has been fundamental to the women's movement from day one, that is class struggle. Working people putting demands on employers is a type of, of, of class struggle. I don't know, don't know what else uh, you would call it. Economic um, struggle. <laughs> but these are people in different, the point is that these are people in radically different structural positions. Some people have wealth some people own uh, the means of, uh, of production. Other people are without wealth. The, what they have to do is sell their, their capacity to work to others uh, in order to survive. There's a fundamental inequality there, class inequality, right? Some people rule, uh, some people don't. Uh, some people command, some people obey. When you don't have any resources, when your life is, you know, working for a wage or a salary, uh, when you're beholden to someone else, another class of people for employment, for your livelihood, that's a system. You know, that's a systemic <laughs> system of class inequality. And when people who work make demands on those who employ them, uh, for whatever reason, material, moral, put whatever label you like on it. To me, that's class struggle. And you have to understand that fundamental structural rift in, in American society. That's the vision that Marxism provides. You know, populism just obscures that with these categories of the productive and the unproductive, uh, it seems to me. Uh, it sometimes gets it right, um, um, uh, by mistake, usually, uh, inadvertently. But, uh, um, uh, it's, it's this vision that Marxism has, this understanding that we live in a society in which you know, some people hire and some people are hired. Some people have the power to fire and command other people. Uh, and most of us follow orders. Uh, and we fear to step out of line. Because you know, this pervasive fear in class-divided societies um, which is one of the reasons why the resistance to uh, the onslaught from above is, you know, is uh, 
has been so feeble, it seems to me. You can't understand the, the, the fear that pervades American workplaces, it seems to me, except from this fundamental perspective that some people are radically dependent on others for their work, for their jobs, for their incomes. And in that situation, you hesitate before you speak up. You hesitate to act with others, right? I don't see that populism really captures that uh, as well as Marxism. Um, so that's, you know, that analysis, it seems to me, is quite powerful. And again, entirely, entirely missing from, uh, entirely missing from uh, social movement studies. I like to point out to my students, you know, this dependency and this fear, you know, it, it, it really is quite pervasive. I, it's, you even find it at universities among tenured faculty, believe it or not, right? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? I mean, leave aside service workers, <laughs> fast food workers, you know, uh, unskilled workers who can be replaced. But, you know, at NYU, how many times do I meet, uh, you know, professors with some job security? They won't say a, they won't say a fucking word about the, you know, the ridiculous conditions that exist at the university for other people, right? For other people who are being radically screwed. Uh, and why don't they speak up? They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to fall out of favor with the deans. They worry about their, you know, they worry about their promotion. They worry about their <laughs> salary increase. They worry, you know, just about being excluded from the inner circle of people at the university who get the opportunities that, you know, are appointed to the committees, et cetera, et cetera. Just that's at NYU, and I'm sure it's at CUNY as well. You know, can, and again, can you imagine? Evidently, social movement scholars cannot imagine, you know, this, how this fear pervades, uh, uh, let's say, ordinary workplaces with unskilled or semi-skilled workers. How can, you, how can you understand that fear from a populist uh, perspective, right? If you're lumping uh, tenured full professors together with the McDonald's workers, that does not seem a Marxist vision of class to me. Uh, most of Marxism, at least in sociology in the 20th century and since, was all about making these distinctions. Well, you know, manual workers versus mental workers, people who have a certain expertise that they can use versus not. There, there are a lot of differences, and they reflect political differences and a search for well, an We don't ally. disagree about this. It, you, what you're, making what a you're describing point. is much more of a populist point. view of class where everybody except the 1% is screwed. That's not a Marxist vision of class. Well, you know, there are a lot of differences, obviously, between tenured mm -hmm. faculty and McDonald's workers. And I agree that, you know, uh, we may not live to see the day when we're marching arm, arm in arm uh, uh, for the revolution with, uh, with, with uh, those working class people. My colleagues certainly will not be there. I agree. <laughs> but there is this fun that there, there nonetheless remains this fundamental similarity. From even the most privileged, the point is even the most privileged and skilled employees in this economy have something, you know, they share something very fundamental and important with uh, the lowest paid minimum wage workers in this country, and that's this dependency. That's class, it seems to me. Okay, now if you want to get in the game of, you know, well, you know, where does one class begin, one class then, so be it. But it seems to me that there is this, this, you know, there is this similarity. And I simply mentioned the, you know, I don't want to make a big deal of the, you know, of the, of the professoriate. You know, I could care less, really. The point I was trying to make is it was really about uh, the nature of the society in which we live. Forget about universities. Just ordinary workplaces across the country. The ordinary people whose wages have not gone up for 40 years. The ordinary people whose unions have been destroyed, the ordinary people whose pensions are being taken away. Again, this is not class struggle, this is populism. I don't get it. Okay? The, to understand the pervasive fear which prevents a formidable pushback to this onslaught, to this, you know, to this class struggle from above, has a lot to do 
right, with this pervasive fear. You cannot understand the pervasive fear without understanding something which seems to me Marx and the Marxist tradition got absolutely right, right? Some people have wealth, other people do not. The ones who don't work for the people who do. They follow the authority of those who do. They follow the commands of those who do. And generally with a smile on their face because they know if they rock the boat, they can be cut off, they can be let go, they can be fired, demoted, all the rest. To me, that's class. That is the class, the key class divide. And you cannot understand what's happened in this country in the last 40 years, it seems to me. You can understand the everyday nature of work in this country, it seems to me, without this you know, very basic Marxist insight. Let me ask, um, how are we to understand why some groups do form social movements and some don't? If, they're all, if it's in fact actually an all economic struggle or class struggle, and all class struggle is about people in workplaces being frightened and downtrodden, where do we get social movements? And why, I mean, there have been a lot of social movements. Uh, we, I, I, as a social movement scholar, I'd like to understand where they come from. Uh, why do some people who are downtrodden and afraid in their workplaces manage to organize themselves? Why did we, why have we had a, a, a very lively LGBTQ family of movements in the right, last right, 30 right. years? Uh, how can they escape them? A lot of other movements have too. I'm not arguing that this fear is an absolute barrier to collective action. I'm simply saying this is the terrain on which we have to begin thinking about how movements arise, right? That barrier of fear has to be overcome, obviously. And it can be overcome, and it has been overcome. But I'm simply saying let's recognize it. Now, if you want to talk about how organizing takes place and how resistance you know, can overcome this barrier of fear, you know, we can talk about that. Uh, people get together. They meet in private. They meet underground. They meet secretly. They share experiences. They understand we can only win collectively. Uh, in numbers, people are more confident. They understand they have more power. And at some point, they come forth and they make collective demands. They demand a union. They demand higher wages, but they do so collectively. But one of the prerequisites of that is precisely overcoming this, this fear that I described. Again, it's not an absolute barrier to collective action. I just don't think you can understand. It's not a barrier which uh, the wealthy, the privileged face, when they exercise their power, it doesn't require collective action. It doesn't require scheming. It doesn't require the mobilization of you know, collective resources. Their power is continuous. It's inherent in this social relationship. A boss can make a decision that affects you know, thousands of people instantaneously. No worker can do that. It takes struggle, it takes organization, it involves a long process of of, of accumulating resources, commitment, solid, building solidarity. So there's just this fundamental asymmetry, which I'm, you know, I'm sure you agree is, is there, uh, in, order for, in order for people to fight back. I think we, we want to open it up to questions, but I can't resist. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of what social movement scholars have looked at in the last 10 or 15 years is precisely how do you overcome fear? How do you overcome shame? How do you transform sure. shame into pride and a sense of confidence that you can do something as a group? Mm -hmm. And a lot of that work, in fact, has come out of research on the LGBTQ movements. Um, it applies as well to the labor movement and I think all movements, but um, this, is, this is where a lot of social movement scholars have been quite active. How do you overcome fear? How do you overcome apathy? How do you get people into the streets, and these are emotional dynamics. Right. How do you right. transform, uh, you know, into just anger from a debilitating, fearful anger into uh, a, a, an indignation, an outraged form of anger? Mm -hmm. This is the kind of stuff that a lot of us have been doing in the social movements field. And I think you're saying, and I would agree, that's good. It's crucial, <laughs> and it's good. crucial for uh, those who are politically and economically oppressed as well. 
as, as uh, there's a lot to be learned from that prevalent. literature. I, I wish some people would would take those ideas though into the specific context of the workplace, right? On that terrain, let's see how people right mm -hmm. overcome fear, etc. Right now, you want to learn about that? Go to labor studies. <laughs> we don't do that here. But you know, I agree that work is is absolutely you know absolutely great, and those those are important questions and complementary to what you're calling for. Absolutely, and, sure, and necessary, I think. Sure, absolutely. As a mm -hmm. But we should open it up. I'm sure there are a million uh, questions. <laughs> so. It seems to me that one thing that we have to talk when we talk about Marxism is political economy, and political economy, I think. Might help explain what Jeff is saying about a class struggle, one sided class struggle in this country. Why did the boom cease in the, starting in the 70s? Uh, what was happening with capital, with rate of profit, competition from Japan and Germany, etc., 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 which provides a view of the whole, which is one thing that Marxism, I think, has a very strong claim to, that is to try to place in the totality where things are in relation to each other and in relation to the whole. And we cannot, it seems to me, understand why wages have come down, as you correctly pointed out, unless we talk about political economy, which has been debated extensively. Mm -hmm. uh, whether David Harvey, Bob Brenner, lots of people have talked about, about those issues. And, uh, and I think, in many ways, it's like the most exciting issue. And now, a picket that comes out, mm -hmm. I think I'm pronounce it right in French, but it's making a sensation. It's a book, it's not a Marxist book, it's a some kind of left-wing, non-Marxist, it, it's addressing the big issues of what is happening to capital, and those are the kinds of issues that Marxism discusses. And it's not the small thing, it's the view of the whole. Mm -hmm. and it fits in, it seems to me, with what Jeff is saying about Glass mm -hmm. Yeah, If I may, um, I mean, I certainly agree with that. Two points. One is you can write about inequality and you can write about capitalism without being a Marxist. And in fact, uh, I think we're seeing fairly mainstream or at least neoclassical economists quickly taking over the study of inequality, for better or worse. Uh, but you certainly don't have to be, you, you, Marxism doesn't have a monopoly on those kinds of issues. Okay, but, but even political economy. I mean, to me, the problem with Marxism is its structuralism and, and its systems theory that those kinds of dynamics are thrown up by the system rather than, and I think Jeff underestimates the degree of coordination when he says capitalists don't have to coordinate and they don't have collective action. Well, of course they do. They may be organized. They uh, have structural power, though. That's the point. They have structural power, but they coordinate and they are very active. And this is what has happened in the last four years. This didn't happen by accident. They took over the Republican Party. The Republican took, you know, they they aligned with a, a, a cultural conservative. Party. Well, yeah, but they they the Democrats the, too. The, the, <laughs> they now have the Democrats too. Yeah, exactly. But this was this was a conscious effort. This was not a systems effect as traditional Marxism would have it. Right. I think you need that no, strategic point of view to really understand what has happened in the last forty years. It started in this country and has spread elsewhere. But it's not just, it was, it was not a, a, you know, uh, a necessary effect of systems. This was people with uh, this really nasty vision of the world, I think. Well, you're, you're quite right about that. I, I, simply mean, I simply meant to juxtapose the reality that, you know, ordinary people have a lot more work to do to generate popular power than elites have, than elites have to do. Uh, elites have this structural power, right? They, you know, the, 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 uh, the whole country is dependent upon their investments, upon their, their decisions, right? Entire workforces are, you know, are, are, you know, are, are affected by the decisions of, you know, 15 uh, board of trustee members, uh, okay? And this power is incessant, it, it never ends. It doesn't have to be built. It doesn't have to be the solidarity. It doesn't have to be maintained. You know, everything that a workers' movement, a popular movement, has to do to generate power, you know, it comes easy to these elites. It's an entirely different story. Again, there's just this radical asymmetry. It seems to me that one under underestimates. It doesn't grasp without again this Marxist insight about about the nature of capitalism. So that was the only point. Of course, mm -hmm. capitalists conspire and. 
in all sorts of ways and get together, have collective action, peak organizations, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, they, they, uh, they, they, can, they can go to sleep as well and exert a lot of power, right, while, you know. They we'll, never sleep. <laughs> God damn it, that's the problem. They, uh, you know. <laughs> so there's a, there's a difference between, between that, kind of, that kind of structural power and dependence and, and, and the nature of popular power, which really, which really is a day-by-day -day task of maintaining solidarity and organization and, and building resources. Which elites don't you know, just don't worry, have to worry about, given that they're elites. Go ahead. Well, I think one of the striking things about the last decades is that th these new social movements are much more salient and more visible and more active than the working class is. And I, I think it's probably a Marxist mm -hmm. who thinks that's mm -hmm. a big problem. Okay, mm -hmm. that that <clears throat> the social weight that an aroused working class could have would be important to the success, actually, of those other movements and also of transforming society. But I think that the reason why all of this can come up um, as a serious discussion is that the working class has been, for the most part, invisible. And it's because its struggles haven't been out there in the way that they were <clears throat> in the 30s and 40s, and that's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. It's also a puzzle to Marxists in a way that it's not to other people, it's a puzzle to Marxists because, uh, and to most social scientists, because we assume that people are driven by their material interests primarily. Well, it turns out a lot of poor people in this country and working class people are driven by religious ideologies just as much or maybe even more than their economic interests. Um, this, we have to explain, I don't think it's just fear in the workplace because not everybody even has a workplace and or has very different relationships to the workplace. There are other factors at work that explain why people don't mobilize, why people are paralyzed, or why people are active Republican Party members, uh, people who don't have much money, who don't have resources, whose every economic interest is the opposite. Right? Okay, so I think I we need I would, to... I, yes, I just think that, that to the extent that people act against their own economic interests, it's a disorientation. So it's true, they do, and we see it in the, in the millions, but... Um, yeah. See, that's a Marx, uh, Marxist view, is they've got false Mar consciousness. Yeah, well, I'm very uneasy that's, with... That's not the Marxist view, and Marx never used that term. I mean, there are lots Marx of Marx, Marxist. There are a lot of Marxist explanations for working class quiescence, apathy, reformism, you name it, okay? Uh, uh, the fact that you know working people are not mobilized, resisting, and labor movements in some countries are are on their heels doesn't say a word for is irrelevant to the question is Marxism wrong or right. Good, the Marxist thesis isn't that you know if workers aren't making revolution in every country around the world 24 hours that the theory's wrong. Marxism doesn't say that, you know. And if you know if workers are you know. If workers' behavior is shaped more by baptism or evangelicalism than by uh, ideas of class struggle, again, that doesn't mean Marxism is wrong. It means that the level of class consciousness in the society, of class organization, for reasons we need to explore, is uh, remarkably low, and that other types of organizations, other types of relationships and associations have become dominant in, in the lives of these people. And we have to understand why that's the case as well. But it doesn't say, the implication one would draw is that Marxism is wrong because workers are inactive or reformist. That's just not the kind. Let's get a couple of questions from students, like Ned. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I guess there's, so there's a few things that like, aren't under debate. Here, right, so I think everyone agrees that bracketing off class and political economy and explaining politics is irresponsible uh, at best. Um, and then this is less agreeable, but I think a lot of people would agree that Marxism is probably has the most developed, longest running track record of explaining class and political economy. Um, I think I agree with Jeff that populism is like for for our politics, it's something we settle for, but like analytically, it's not it's not that handy. Um, but this is more, so I agree with kind of what Jeff is saying here, but this is a, a question targeted at Jeff. Um, you know, so what is, what needs to be explained that is left unexplained by Marxism? Um, 
And if we're not going to just use ad hoc explanations every time this thing pops up, what kinds of theories do you, or analytical tools, do you recommend to complement, supplement, fill in the gaps? You mean to understand the evolution of species, or the origins of the right. universe, <laughs> so, or <laughs> the periodic table? <laughs> Marxism isn't a theory of everything. You know, I, I can't even. I, well, so, so it would in, take in me uh, the rest of my life in, to tell you what Marxism <clears throat> does. So, in, in, in political sociology, so I can give you an example to make it clear. So, I'm thinking of you know Marshall Gans' book on yeah. yeah. farm workers, right? So he says, where the given the same structural conditions, where the Teamsters failed and AFL-CIO failed. United Farm Workers succeeded, right? And he mm -hmm. attributes that to right. things that cannot be explained by political economy. Right. Um, and he's got theories, pulls on theories like organizations and things like that to to, to explain that. So I'm just kind of wondering, what are some other? Ned, I, I the, it's it's a long list. You yeah. know, I'm not here to say that. You know, I'm not here to defend Marxism as the theory. Uh, that answers all our questions about socialism. So the question we're, we're debating is, you know, uh, do we need it? Okay, do we need it? And, and my position, obviously, is that is that we do. But but that's not to say that we, we don't need any number of other conceptual tools. So uh, I'm not arguing that you know you have to be a, you know a uh, you, you know Marxism tells you everything you need to know about about anything. Um, uh, so, so I, I, I can't Jeff, really. There, can I just ask? Group. Go ahead, do that. Let's clarify. <laughs> I would. I I find the premise of this discussion odd. What if I flipped the question around and said, "What does social movements theory have to say about the world?" Which Marxists didn't already know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, and I'm not being facetious because when I went to grad school and I learned, I, I read this thing called social movements theory. It consisted of either truisms, like you need to have some resources to have a movement. People need to get pissed off or emotionally, which is, of course, true. Uh, that there needs to be some kind of strength and leverage that people need to have, et cetera, et cetera. And I can't imagine who, which organizers don't know that already. On the other hand, um, most of the really active social movements, including the LGBT movement in this century, have been led by socialists or people of the left or people who took some kind of training out of either the labor movement or the socialist left or something like that. And if the proof is in the pudding, then certainly the burden of proof is on social movements theory, not on Marxism, in terms of actually having something to say about how you build movements and how you understand the world. Now, the, I think it's a mischaracterization to say that Marxism is simply political economy and nothing else. Marxists take the political economy as the structuring fact, as you said, and as, as Jim agrees, about the world. But no Marxist ever said, if you get the structures right, sit back, grab a Coke, and the revolution will take care of itself. I don't know where that comes from. The organi I mean, everybody who was on the socialist left spent their lives building these organizations that scholars are pointing out are important, or the institutions, or the solidarity. That's what pe so that's not, an, that's not an insight that social movement theory has, nor is framing. How, who doesn't know about framing? Nor is this stuff about organizational capacity and resource. These are just fancy words that post-60s social scientists came up with to capture the insights that organizers already had. So I, I would actually reverse the billing and I'd say, what on earth has social movements theory said? And I'm not, I suppose this is provocative, but let it be. What has social movements theory said that wasn't already known? He <laughs> was intervening in your question and answer with Ned. You go first. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I really, I've never come across anything sure. which is not fully no, I, present, I, I, theorized, uh, and understood and appreciated by the people who were in no, all I, of these movements. I, I think I, I think I may largely agree with you. I mean, I assign. The Communist Manifesto to my students. What what can you find there? Well, you find about the importance of framing, although that word isn't used. You you learn about the importance of organization. You learn about the importance of identities. Uh, you learn about the importance of research. And that's the weakest document Marx. <laughs> <laughs> and in a sense, yeah, it's all there. And you know, 
you can ask students to kind of transpose those ideas uh, from the working class to uh, uh, to African Americans, to, to gay and lesbian people, to to to, to women, and um, and they find actually there's a lot there, which explains how people come together, discover that they have common interests, discover a common, build a common identity, build solidarity, learn how to struggle through struggle, etc. So you know I. Um, I guess I'm agreeing with you. I mean, if you look at the common sense of the labor movement from the 1920s to the 1960s, mm -hmm. what was it? It took the political economy, what you said. There's people who have power, there's who don't. All we have going for us is our numbers. And that common sense, then we have to build on those numbers, that was taken over into the civil rights movement, that was taken over into the women's movement. It's also been used in the LGBT movement, every single one of them. Mm -hmm. So I'm not... I'm not sure I get what the puzzle is about here about the, the, the premise of this debate about does Marxism have something to say. I really think that it should be flipped around, which is to say, how does social movement theory persist with this myth that it's got something to add? Let me, let me uh, One take step a at a time, Vivek. Yeah. We're, we're, dealing with a field, we're dealing with a field of study where Marxism right, is non-existent these days. Uh, I don't know, of course, I, I totally understand. Right. Yeah, and so, you, you know, the first thing to do is establish, <laughs> the first thing to do is establish that it might have, you know, these ideas might have some relevance. But I, you know, I like, your to, hear Jim, I like to hear Jim respond. Though your, premise, your argument is that back when Marxism was a, a stronger force in social movement studies in the early 70s, um, that we had better understandings of social movements. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, in fact, you know, if Marxism was feeding some, you know, Tilly's early work and so on, some of that highly structural stuff, there was a lot missing. Uh, well, I'm not taking Tilly as my exemplar of what you want to be, right? That no, but this is Jeff's argument <laughs> that you know, 30 years ago, we had all, you know, Marxism was a dominant, capitalism was there, and we've lost that, and social movements stuff, uh, social movement theory has gone downhill. As a result, Absolutely. I mean, the communists were the backbone of organizers in the mid 20th century, no question about it. But it's not always because of their Marxist theory. They, what Marxism gave them that was most important, I would say, is this confidence that in the end they were going to win. And they devoted their lives to the CIO, to to all sorts, of, to, you know, every social movement, civil rights, and and so on. They believed that in the future they were going to. When it was a strong you emotional thing. Because the, because the millenarians believe that too, and they get, get it in the ass all the time. <laughs> the, the Marxists also well. had real gains. They had real, they had real victories. But that, and that was because they actually knew something about how to organize. Okay, but um, today in the United States, you really think that Marxists have the upper, communists have the upper hand over millenarians? And I'm not sure is, who's winning the, the, the political, uh, the political politics in this country. Millenarians have a really powerful force going with them. <laughs> and, 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 and that's all the people who you say have taken over the Republican Party. Uh, you give me that kind of money and I'll win too. No, no I, I agree. I can agree with that. Hi. Um, you know, I have to admit I'm sitting here in a little bit of disbelief because it seems to me that there's, Professor Jasper, there seems to be a misreading on your part of what Marxism is and what it's not. I mean, in the book, and I've read some of the book, they explain that there are different variations. There's an entire spectrum of what Marxism is and what it isn't, right? And let's leave aside the question of sectarianism, but I think that fundamentally, uh, the question of political economy has to be put back on the table. On that note, I'm a doctoral student at the CUNY Graduate Center, and I would like to hear your opinion or your take on the question of the political economy of producing research, right? Because I do think that in the past 30 years, 20 or so years, there's been a, a, a dominant paradigm, you know, that, that post this, post that, the only post I adhere to is Kellogg's, right, or, or <laughs> Cheerios. That's the only post I'm interested in. So I'm wondering if you can talk about the disappearance of class struggle. And by the way, just a, a quick anecdote, when I was preparing my proposal, I explicitly mentioned class struggle in my mm -hmm. proposal. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm studying CUNY's history, particularly in 1969 and 1976 when <coughs> tuition was imposed. So of course, there's class struggle there, right? Well, I was told by some of my committee members, who shall not, you know, mm -hmm. that I should take out. It should be taken out. 
Okay, it was said to be implicitly and explicitly in different occasions. So there is a real political economy of producing research, and in fact, a lot of students here, I'm sure there are some doctoral students here who can attest to this, right? Mm -hmm. So can, can you talk about it? Because I think that's crucial, right? If I can't talk about class struggle in my proposal, where can we talk about it? Mm -hmm. Uh, if I were on the committee and I had suggested taking it out, I would have wanted you to replace it with much less vague, much more specific mechanisms that were there. You know, class struggle is very broad. Uh, can you see class struggle? You know, if I, you know, I would like this. That's very telling. Yeah. Wow. I mean, maybe that's what you were told. I would like to. You know, what does it mean? Who's who, what? Which class is acting? You know, in whose interest? There is this notion in Marxism that classes are actors. This is the basic, this is behind class struggle. I find it a bit problematic. Um, there's also um, an assumption that... A boss uh, fires a worker. That's class struggle, Jim. That's a boss firing a worker. It's that's not, not a, that's that's not not a, class a class capitalist struggle? class doing something to the working no, class. You're, you've that's got an a very individual. narrow understanding of class struggle. Yes. It reflects struggle. It, it's a struggle, certainly. Um, so, I, it, you know, it's just... From, you know, as an advisor of students, I would want to know, well, what are you going to look at? How are you going to know whether there's class struggle, whether there's not? It's hard. How could you disprove the hypothesis that there's class struggle there? How would you, how would you be able to say, oh my God, I was wrong. There's no class struggle here after all. How would you, what would you, what would you find there to disprove it? Are you actually asking me? Yeah, yeah. Look, in 1969, there was a movement of students Right? These were black and Puerto Rican students who were driven by different ideologies. There was uh, black nationalism, there was Marxism, as the was very active, that was supportive of the movement there. And there were also different political formations, political formations, bureaucratic formations, and the interaction of all those formations, I think, is part of the class struggle. After all, CUNY was about 98% white, right, in 1968, before that, right? There was a small group of students who were six students, right? These were the black and Puerto Rican students who were specifically uh, recruited from, you know, the high schools, uh, from low socioeconomic backgrounds. Well, that program was actually created by some of the black politicians at the time, right? And why did they do that? Well, they had to get votes, right? So here they have an incentive to actually create programs that would attract specific students into a, the city university, yeah. which is, by the way, publicly funded, right? So there's another factor that you have to take into account. So why is that class struggle? If a politician wants votes and knows how to get votes, that seems to me a political incentive, right? Political that I can understand, but I'm not sure how to understand it as class struggle. Where there were conflicts between the different groups, right? Class okay. conflicts. Okay. Okay, now you're getting on something I can understand as class struggle. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, but, as, but as part of what you're... You, you, what was your question about why, why political economy has disappeared yeah, and why people look at you like you're from outer space if you say you're interested <laughs> in political economy? I think there's a very simple reason, and, and that's that there's been, you know, Marxism, the influence of, the cultural influence of Marxism has just dropped off the table since the period, since the 1960s, 1970s, which was the period when this field of social movement states actually, uh, actually arose. Um, and if you go back to those days, well, capitalism was a major concern. Political economy, uh, right up through the early 80s, actually, you can look at a book like uh, Doug McAdams' study of civil rights, was, was very prominent. But, you know, as, as we move on, and again, this is an effect of this long class struggle I've been talking about. Uh, right. You know, the radical movements disappear, the labor movement disappears, uh, domestication of academics, uh, that in, those influences dissipate. And by, by, the, by the 1980s, really middle of the 1980s, you can't find anyone in the social movements field who uses these terms, who thinks in terms of political economy, right? Tilly, Tilly changes his direction right, um, among others. Um, I, I think it's a simple explanation, right? I think uh, if Marxism is weak in the society, if left 
movements are weak in the society, if radical movements are weak in the society, they, they, they're not going to persist in, in, the, in the academy. Or rather, the kind of radicalism that persists in the, in the academy becomes this kind of abstruse, you know, post-structuralist uh, nonsense, right? But it's not, uh, right, but it's not helpful to, to anyone. You think Chuck Tilley was quaking with fear and changed his work because he was a, had fear in his workplace? Like Columbia somehow or the New School was going to come down on him? I don't think he got any support him? for it. I don't think he got any support for it. I think the people who appreciated uh, his early work that emphasized class struggle, proletarianization, disappeared, right? He didn't have, there was not a community of scholars that supported that kind of work for Tilly or for anyone. And so his work, you know, drifted as everyone's work drifted to, to new concerns, new issues. Uh, so it wasn't out of fear in, in his case, but I, I do think that a, you need a community of scholars to perpetuate, reproduce any theoretical tradition, Marxism, post-structuralism, you name it. And when those communities dissipate, as I think they did, because of larger trends in the society, then, then it becomes very hard uh, for, uh, for individuals to, to, kin to continue to write in that tradition. Mm -hmm. And so it's completely disappeared. I'm done. Uh, One last question, because <laughs> we're a little over oh, time. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm a veteran of Jeff's social movement classes, but we only read the old stuff. So I mean, this question might be a bit <laughs> obtuse. But I, I mean, I'm thinking of the key questions that we address in that seminar, and two of them spring to mind. One is, when do social movements emerge? When and how do social movements emerge? Mm -hmm. And the other is, when and how do social movements win? And for both of those questions, it seems to me the old stuff that we read does a fantastic job of answering either answering both the question of how they emerge and how they win. And I'm wondering, um, Professor Jasper, what you think the contribution of the new stuff, the, the new turn that you've been talking about, the framing and the emotions, really adds to the, the answers that were given by, say, Piven and Cloward or McAdam to those two first questions. So Michael Schwartz. Or Schwartz, yes, of course. But so take take for instance like the civil rights movement. Is the is the claim really that the civil rights movement emerged when it did because they happened upon the correct kind of framing, um, a kind of framing that they didn't have in the fifties or in the forties, or that people somehow became more indignant in the in the sixties and uh, or in the fifties and sixties than they were once in the forties and thirties, and that that had nothing to do with changes in social structures. And then is the claim also that the reason that they won or the reason that they or any other movement wins is because they start to frame their demands correctly or they start to somehow incite people by using clever language, uh, something like that, rather than the Marxist political economy argument, which is that they figure out a way to impose costs upon elites and win consent. I mean, is the claim really that it's framing and it's sort of clever rhetoric? That no, nobody that, claims that. Yeah, that nobody that. claims that. So then what is it adding? I mean, then I guess we return to the big question, which is what is it adding? Okay, uh, could you, what would a political economy explanation of the rise of the animal rights movement look like in the late 80s, early 90s? Was I mean, there, there really a, some kind, could you no, do I mean, that? No, I think I, my position, and maybe other people don't share this, is that those are sort of different kettle of fish, right? I, I don't think of those as social movements, per se. Perhaps the claim that you're making is that, okay. you know, the new turn in social movements can explain why 10 college kids gather in a room and have a meeting, or why the animal rights movement emerged, but it doesn't explain the civil rights movement or the labor movement. Maybe that's fine. Maybe I agree with that. Okay, well, let's just stick with the civil rights movement then. Um, the civil rights movement was a real. McAdam goes into the boll weevil and things that had happened in the teens and 20s yeah, and migration. 30s and yeah. the migration and so on. Um, Alden Moore says the great, basically says the great migration is nonsense, that it was not. Uh, it wasn't whites and it wasn't northern blacks. It was really much more in indigenous. Uh, you know, but I don't think, I wouldn't, I, I mean, if you want an explanation. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education in 54. Now, what you might think I'm going to say is, well, it inspired the Civil Rights Movement because it was this great. In fact, it inspired the White Citizens Councils. Uh, the fear, there you have fear, there you have a sense of threat, there you have a very active um, uh, you know, sort of angry white citizenship. This helped then inspire organizing uh, among uh, black, Southern blacks. 
1960, the sit-in was a great tactical invention. It wasn't entirely new, but it really took off then. Um, can you explain the invention and the spread of the sit-ins in political economy terms? No, you can't explain the, the invention of the sit-in, but the sort of invention of new tactics like that is something you assume happens in the course of social movements. So it doesn't add any, anything the spread of the The spread of the sit-in tactic depended upon an urbanized black population. It depended upon the development of, of black colleges. This is all part of the political economy of post-war America, right? You can't say it's unrelated, you know. direct the, connection of the labor movement to Highlander and several institutions directly. The role of Highlander is, is key. They came out of the labor movement. Yeah. I can say if everything is part of political economy, then I would have to agree political economy is really important. But it seems to lose some of the bite if all of these things are part of political economy then. Then we can agree. But... You know, the, the, the point is you can't, you can't understand the, the transformations that made possible something like the sit-in yeah. movement without understanding the radical change in the South's political economy from a sharecropping economy to one in which uh, increasing numbers of blacks took up urban employment, you know, worshipped in the same churches, met each other, you know, in black colleges, black churches, etc. And, you know... Uh, you know, this wasn't strictly determined in every in, in every molecule by political economy, but of course, it's the fundamental background for all of these yeah, developments. The, the other side of it is is the transformation of the southern elites that occurs because yeah. of the transformation of the southern economy from one centered around a labor oppressive plantation complex to one where you can have a mechanized agriculture, yeah. which for the first time can afford to give the kind of rights to its citizens which it never could before because their rights would have meant the destruction of the entire southern economy. And now for the first time you're able to split the elites so that there's elites now within the south that are, able, that are willing to countenance giving civil rights to the population that was simply never possible before. I don't think the, the, the theory is required to explain the sit-ins. The theory says even if the sit-ins had not occurred, some kind of progress would have been made because of the combination of the structural factors and the, the contingent but real presence of organizations that have been able to draw on this. But it, it, by no means, I don't think it's even possible to understand why the civil rights movement occurs unless you understand how the, the ruling class in the South changes after the transformation of agriculture in the 30s. Yeah. It's, 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 no theory can explain it without that. Okay, but the, you know, again, the question is really about the timing, why a movement move, move, emerges when it does. I think that's hard to explain you know, the timing so precisely without these more proximate yeah. factors on top of the political economy, the issue structural is that factors. The understanding of those proximate factors was never missing from Marxist social movements understanding. Never. Literally. And the, the proof in the pudding is they spent all their time building them. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all do thought, things we don't necessarily say theoretically. Exactly, right? that's very right. true. And what, what was missing was an, uh, an abstract theorization of those things. Right. And much of the scholarship of the first generation of social movements theory post sixties, like McAdam, really builds on that. It makes that explicit and brings it up. The, the weird thing is that becomes incorporated into something called social movements theory. It forgets half of that by the eighties, and then it says, "Well, does Marxism have anything to say?" Yeah. Which is bizarre. Which is not really a question anybody but Jeff asks. So <laughs> this is not a common question. So, but I think the rest of so the history of social movement theory is doing exactly the same thing. We are learning what most activists already know about emotional dynamics and so on, right? And that we're, we're lost to in the academic study of social movements, which has its history back in, uh, in a period when university students and professors were elites and looked down their noses at uh, activists and had this Olympian uh, arrogant distance from them. I think we're, we're still on this long trajectory of coming to grips with what activists know. And I think it's, it includes political economy issues, but it certainly includes much more subjective, cultural, emotional mechanisms as well. I to respond quickly to Donner, just because it, it was a strong man mm. argument, right? No one uses framing as, as causally uh, powerful as an causal estimation. That's just wrong, man. That's just wrong. There's article after right. article yeah. in the okay. literature okay. that so, pointed so, to framing so, as right. necessary, yeah. as decisive, as 
key to understand. So then, that, so then that, that's bad. That's wrong. Well, <laughs> that's what it's doing. And the next right, they're like. And there's not just a little literature. There's a huge literature. Right. Making this so let's agree right? that there's lots of bad social science across all the time. With that, we can all agree, and we're we've. We ran right, out of time 15 minutes ago, so thank you all for coming. <laughs> and we have to stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.